Thank you very much. So a little taken aback to see Lawrence concluding by suggesting the royal family take out a hit on the Prime Minister. <laughs> but in these surreal times, frankly, it doesn't even seem the strangest possibility uh, going around. I just hope there's nobody in the room from the Daily Mail. It seems, <laughs> seems unlikely at this university. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for allowing me to be here and to talk about this subject. We were actually asked to talk about, I think, the impact of the proposed arrangements. <laughs> it was like, which proposed arrangements? That is the question. It is strange to have a situation where one genuinely has no idea of what the legal situation may be in two days, or two weeks, or two months, or two years, or two decades, frankly, because almost any direction is quite imaginable. Um, so all I did was pick a few possible scenarios and consider some implications of them for trade. Um, and those three are Norway, as they like to call it in this country, and May's deal, and a no deal. And I've just got some remarks on them, and they give me an excuse to explore some issues. I mean, Norway. Norway seemed dead, and now it's come back to life. And that does seem to be a bit of theme of the whole Brexit process, doesn't it? Um, in a way, it, it was mentioned enthusiastically, you know, maybe with a little desperation just after the vote, and then it seemed completely impossible. And in some ways, it is, of course, a betrayal of the vote. For an EU lawyer, you think, ah, you're practically in. But at the same time, think, why did people vote? I don't think people voted because they were unhappy with the standardisation of goods, um, or you know, the regulation of financial services. I don't think they've really voted about the Court of Justice. Boris gets upset about that, but nobody else does. Um, a few Labour lawyers maybe, um, or they may be happy about it. Um, perhaps one might argue that to some extent people voted because there's been a significant influx of union citizens to the UK. That may have played a role in the Brexit vote, but even then it doesn't seem to me that it was the great issue. We'll talk about immigration. They're not really talking about other Europeans primarily. So in some ways, Norway gives you a symbolic Brexit, um, but it gives you also the advantages of membership to a large extent. And, you know, it's this difficulty looking for a solution in a place that hasn't actually caused your problem. And I always thought that the, the real British problem with the EU is just a general sense of not fitting, a kind of unheimish, unheimish, you know, we don't quite belong, we are a bit different, which they are, we are, I suppose, um, although perhaps everyone is. Um, but just a, a feeling of a cultural difference, a feeling of cultural discomfort, and I always thought that what, you, what Britain really needs is to depoliticise its membership, actually, because it doesn't, probably less than almost any country, Britain doesn't really have a problem with the substantive rules uh, imposed by EU membership, unlike France, that doesn't believe in globalisation or competition law, for example. It does. Um, it, it really embraces the substance of EU law to a large extent. It's just that general political bit that it feels uncomfortable with. And this is like being able to be in the club without having to go to the meetings. I actually think, you know, and you still exert influence. And in Norway, I believe, has just as much influence outside as it would inside because it's sensible. It says sensible things. And then people listen to it. And Britain, in better times, I think, is capable of being sensible. But to do that, it has to escape the politics of, of the EU. So I always thought Norway would be, in the long term, something, you know, a North, but of course, it doesn't solve the Northern Irish border because people think that's all about customs. Um, and then Norway is not in the, in the customs union. But one can tack that on. That is allowed, it seems. One could have a Norway plus. Um, in some ways, that would be, I think, along the longer term, a comfortable home for the British. But it seems that that horse has bolted. So I mention it quickly and move on because it seems like the horse has gone. On the other hand, it also seems like the horse is running in circles and has taken drugs. So <laughs> it's not unimaginable that at some point it will bolt right back into the stable again. Who knows? We'll see. But I'm going to move on to the undead, the zombie maze deal. Um, which is, you know, some, nobody's found the wooden stake to plunge into its heart yet, and so it just keeps on. Although maybe Bertel has it, because I gather he's um, talked about not letting it come back again, um, so maybe you know, he's found the stake. But until then, it will keep rising out of the grave and uh, walking around making strange noises. Of course, the strange thing is, this isn't a proposed arrangement. The, the, the newspapers sometimes speak about it as if this is a new framework. All it is, is a delay of Brexit for two years and a voluntary surrender of the Whiteman right to revoke Article 50. Because once you enter the transition period, you can't, you, you laterally go back to being a member. But otherwise, it just leaves everything open to discussion. It's just, that's all it is. It's just a Brexit delay for two years. There's no more substance to it, um, as far as I can see, other than, of course, the backstop. And one of the most fascinating things of this whole process, I mean, to think that 
that the, the country, both left and right, would become passionate about customs unions um, and, and the backstop. It's, uh, we didn't know, I don't think many people saw this coming. There may have been some clever lawyers who did. I certainly didn't, I have to admit, that, when it, that the hardest part about breaking up would be talking about Northern Ireland and, and, and customs unions. But it turns out that's what might torpedo the whole thing. Now, I'm sure everybody knows much, much, much more about the backstop than they ever wanted to know. But it's just briefly, I mean, just for, for interlopers, people who come off the street because it's raining. I mean, it was very, it, it, the essence is that if there's no success in negotiating some new e relationship, then the, the, the border between Northern and Southern Ireland must remain open, um, and therefore that requires some compliance with EU law as a suggestion. So Northern Ireland essentially says in the internal market for goods, and the rest of the UK continues to comply with labour law, environmental law, and competition law, I think, and customs law. Um, and that means that it's possible to then have trade without too much stress and so on. And the reason given for this always is the Good Friday agreements, you know, which ended decades of violence. Um, and that would be a very good reason. There's nothing about open borders in the Good Friday agreements. I actually don't think, it's not certainly not in the letter of the agreements. I don't even think it's in the spirit, having not been an expert but having read them. I mean, the spirit of the agreements is very much um, everyone essentially being able to be who they are. Millennial kind of, you know, that, you know, so whatever your identity, whatever your view on the proper uh, country that you belong to in Northern Ireland, you should be able to live as you wish to live. And so it's important. Openness between um, Ireland and Northern Ireland is definitely implicit in the spirit. And, and obstacles to people moving up and down, even I think minor obstacles, would perhaps violate the spirit. One could certainly argue that. But some kind of infrastructure at the border, hanging up cameras, whatever, having board policemen watching trucks drive by, um, would not, I don't think, be an obstacle, actually violating the spirit. Um, and the reason why I make that point is not to say let's put a border up, because whether or not it's in the Good Friday Agreements, it's really clear that there are a lot of people who feel very strongly about this and feel that it would be distressing, and for some of them, a very small number, I mean, this is the way the IRA's finest hour, they finally managed to break the British state, you know, um, but for a small number, it would be a reason to resort to violence. And okay, nobody wants violence to come back, and so that's a very good reason to take this seriously. I don't have any problem with that. But it's worth making the point um, that it's, this is what it's about, because it does seem to me one of the elements of the Good Friday Agreements, which is in there and should be taken seriously, is there should be a kind of s symmetry. The reason why it's so important that there should be openness between Ireland and Northern Ireland is because half the population of Northern Ireland feels Irish, and quite understandably so. That's where they belong and they find it deeply offensive to have an obstacle there. Fine. But of course the other half feels British and finds it equally offensive to have an obstacle between them, and they've got the sea, they can't do much about that, anyway. pray. But, um, but you know, to have any kind, other kind of obstacle between them and the rest of Great Britain. And it seems to me, just as a matter of, of fairness, that has to be taken equally seriously. And so the suggestion, for example, of Barnier, you know, well, you could always have checks between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. It's not that I want to sound like a a British patriot or something, but it is actually quite offensive. If you're taking this seriously, there are two communities with genuine, deeply felt identities, you know, you can't have it either place. And, does, and the point of this is to make this, it's, it's not about Good Friday. The whole backstop situation is the EU's reluctance to engage with a degree of economic risk. They don't want smuggling, they don't want unauthorised goods entering the EU market. And I don't know whether they're playing the Irish or the Irish are playing them, actually. I mean, that's an interesting question uh, in this. But certainly they're trying to play the Irish. They're trying to use the moral rhetoric of, of the Good Friday Agreements essentially to preserve certain, you know, to minimise certain economic risks. But, but I'd like to look at those. You know, what is, what are these economic risks? I mean, smuggling, customs, the idea that, you know, goods will come in from Great Britain. If, it's, if there's no backstop, if Britain's out with no arrangement, Goods will come into the internal market not having paid um, their tax, their customs duties. And the other risk is that goods that don't comply with EU standards will enter the market. Um, fine. Now, I mean, there's, there's three borders where you... So you, maybe you need some kind of controls. There's three borders where you can do that. You've got the border between Ireland and the rest of the EU, Port of Dublin, essentially, or the Dublin Airport, Shannon Airport. Um, you've got the border between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain, and you've got the border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. You know, it, they're all pretty problematic places to have obstructions. All of them. So, I mean, 
it seems to me if you really think you need policing, perhaps a, a, the fairest approach to this would be to kind of share the burden, have all you know all three of them engaging in some kind of surveillance. Um, if one just was to approach this from a, a fairness perspective, and the, it's it's really striking the insistence of the EU that there could not be any absolutely, although in some ways this is the least ideologically laden border, the one between Ireland and the EU. And bearing in mind we're only talking about goods, we're not talking about people here. Um, it's the and it's the easiest place. That would actually in some ways be the logical place to have controls. But okay, you could you could share the burden. But anyway, why do this anyway? Why have why have these border controls? And I'm going to draw on what Lawrence said, because the strange thing is, well, what's this border going to be for? Is it going to stop smuggling? You don't stop smuggling at land borders. It's just land borders are hopeless and give up on land borders. They don't do anything. Um, it, unless you build a wall. I mean, if you build a wall, it probably wouldn't work and nobody's going to build a wall. So you won't really stop it. And uh, the big trucks, of course, you could, they, they, they're, they're stuck on big roads. The big trucks, you can check in all kinds of places. It's easy enough to deal with that. You don't need to do anything at the border. It's just monitoring of businesses and imports to the UK and all kinds of stuff. But the border, in that sense, is not a particularly important point. You just generally perhaps have schemes for monitoring movement of goods and, and imports generally. But you don't need stuff at the border. It wouldn't work, and it's not necessary. And the same with you know non-complying goods. Well, I mean, if it's an individual who goes and get a non non-complying bottle of whiskey to take home, is it such a big deal? And if it's for the purpose of sale, you can easily check that at the point of sale. So in some ways, it seems to me this whole idea that there has to be a border at the edge of the EU, it doesn't do anything. It's it's ineffective and superfluous. So if I was going to be loyally, I'd say it violates the principle of proportionality. Um, actually. It would be more, in a way, rational if one was genuinely concerned about these issues, just have a clause in the, in the withdrawal agreement saying under no circumstances will we introduce a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. We will not introduce checks, and we will, all parties will do, take best efforts and work together to prevent smuggling and to monitor and so on, but this will not involve borders. How are they going to do that? Just do stuff, join customs authorities, monitor things, sort it out, because they've got to sort it out anyway. Because the funny thing is, the backstop is until alternative arrangements. Well, what alternative arrangements will these be then? If the EU is saying, well, the only possible alternative arrangements are that you're in the internal market for goods, that's kind of problematic as well, actually, for a country that is exercising its Article 50 right to leave. So in a way, one has to believe, in Sandra, one has to believe that there are alternative arrangements, and if there are, one could just do them straight away. The whole backstop thing is a bit mysterious. But the irony, the real irony of it, of course, is that what it really would be good for is Northern Ireland. Imagine if there was one jurisdiction, a pleasant, green, and pretty jurisdiction where people spoke English, and that was the only place on the planet where you had access to both the British and the EU markets. It, that would become a, a little, you know, multinationals would be going like mad. If you were a British producing company, you'd be relocating to Northern Ireland. It's quite a little manufacturing centre anyway, because you've got access to the UK market and access to the EU market. The Northern Irish would get rich from the backstop. Um, but they're principled, this cost them. So they, you know, that's not enough, they still don't want it. Good for them. But the question I find myself, asking, find myself asking is, what is, the, what is the strategy of the EU and the Irish in pushing this backstop so hard? What are they trying to achieve? And one theory might be that they want a hard Brexit, you know, poor or something, um, and that's their, so they're putting forward something unacceptable um, in order to force a hard Brexit. The other possibility is that they're pushing for Remain. Secretly, they're pushing for Remain. It's not impossible. I mean, you have sort of you know, the, the Sherlock Holmes theory of Brexit. I think it was Sherlock Holmes who said, you know, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however strange, he didn't say it quite like that, must be the truth. Well, if we've eliminated No Deal, and we've eliminated May's zombie deal, um, and we've eliminated any other deal, because the EU won't even talk about that, well then, the only thing left is Remain. So, I mean, not that I'm necessarily saying that's going to happen, but um, sometimes, well, we'll see. I don't know what their strategy is. It's a very strange strategy. Because the big question for the British, before I leave this topic, is why this backstop has become so important, is could they get trapped in it? Um, and as well, argue Jeffrey Cox, he says they could. Um, and I think they, they, certainly they could. But it's quite, how big the risk is, is quite nuanced. Because, I mean, the, the, if you look at the Northern Irish Protocol, and I apologise I don't have slides, but the relative articles are 2 and 20. And essentially, the backstop continues until 
alternative arrangements are made that avoid the need for a border. And Article 2 very strongly suggests, without being satisfyingly clear, that these arrangements would be the new relationship. So once the UK and the EU agree a new relationship, this would then make the backstop unnecessary. And that's problematic, because that means you've got to agree the whole package. So if you can't agree with the French about fish, that could torpedo the relationship and lead to an endless backstop. If you look at Article 20, though, it seems to me to suggest other wording, which basically suggests that at any point, if the backstop's not necessary, the British apply it for the prize to have it lifted. So they, that might be quite irrespective of the other range, which they might say, you know what, we've got now such, such brilliant cameras in our satellites that we can see everything anyway, we can monitor it all, or whatever. There's lots of people who say that technological solutions are achievable. At some point, no doubt they will be. So it wouldn't be dependent, and this seems to me the big issue. If it's dependent on the overall agreement, you've got, you could get trapped in it. If it's purely dependent on finding some other arrangement, and of course, if the backstop turns out to be fairly ineffective, which it probably would, that would increase the force of an argument that it's not necessary and that other arrangements would be just as good. Um, and that would really, that means the chance that you still can't abolish it unilaterally, you've got to go through the tribunal and so on. So that doesn't mean, but the risk of getting trapped in it seems to me actually on the whole fairly low, probably within the boundaries of what one, you know, because life is full of risks. I don't know. Um, but it's a very strange story, this backstop. I mean, the historians are probably going to have fun with it, and I sort of suspect maybe I, we, are all, you know, there's something deeper going on here. It's just bizarre that this fairly big question about the relationship between the UK and the EU could crash and burn on what is something that's both technical and, as far as I can see, kind of wrong-headed. There's something deeper going on, which I haven't quite identified. But for my last few minutes, let's talk about hard Brexit. Um, because that might happen by accident, as people are saying, it's not important. You know, why that might happen is if they get a short extension, um, it could just end up doing it out of frustration. Of course, the great merit of this is I think it's cathartic. You know, there is a certain segment of the population, particularly those who are not interested in engaging with the details of trade law and so on, who just sort of feel the need for it. You know, it's like a, a divorce kind of process. And people need to scream. If you're going to have a tantrum, have a tantrum. Um, and so, you know, it would serve, I think, a certain social function, actually. I mean, there is something to be said for it. Uh, but it would have other disadvantages. Um, you know, what would we lose? Well, there's an awful lot of talk about the customs union. You know, we'd, lose, we'd lose that, and so there'd be barriers to trade, um, and so on, because you wouldn't be in the customs union, and that would be terribly problematic. It's strange, because um, the customs union, customs is being treated as if it's very important. But actually, customs tariffs, as far as I can see, are not very important anymore. International lawyers are not kept awake dreaming of taking down customs tariffs. Or they, they, they dream of mutual recognition. They dream of a world more like Europe, in a way. And the actual levels of customs tariffs on the whole in the world are fairly low. Um, if it was just a question of how much you had to pay, it's not such a big deal. It's the administration, it's the bureaucracy. That's more of a deal. If you're always just in time manufacturing. Uh, people, you know, they like to just be able to drive across borders. But even that... Actually, there is paperwork, and you could do paperwork in advance. I don't think being outside the customs union is, once one adapts a bit, and you know, once one sorts out the technology, I was going to make comments about Android apps and foreigners in Britain. Um, once one sorts out the technology, I don't think that's really a long-term big problem. The bigger problem is the mutual recognition, which is where international trade is at now, seeking to overcome the problem of different standards. Um, and that's a really substantive problem. Can you make goods that you can sell everywhere? That brings big advantages. And in EU, you can, and they'll lose that. And that will be a blow for manufacturing. We'll probably need to export, you know, a loss of firms um, to the continents to some extent. Some might come this way to serve the British market. But that really imposes significant costs and they hinder innovation. And it's just generally likely to be a fairly solidly bad thing bearing in mind that on the whole, standards for products are not a deep reflection of culture and sovereignty. So you don't get much back for it. It's not like you can say, but we can now shape our lives. There's a few issues where that might, GMOs, but on the whole, you don't get much back, you just lose lots of practical advantages to trade. So that would be a big blow of a hard Brexit, losing all that mutual recognition. <coughs> on the other hand, again, how many hands have I done? For my last two minutes, and I was stopping. On the other hand, as a colleague of mine said to me, and I, he should probably remain nameless because he works in Britain, so you might know him, he said, I didn't vote for Brexit, but, 
But, he said, it will do two good things. It'll puncture the housing bubble and it'll destroy the city. And that might be just what the country needs. Um, and I actually think there is a, a sort of a deeper story to what makes a country a success. Well, you know, we all argue about that. But, you know, you can make a plausible argument that things that make an economy thrive are not just being in trading arrangements, they're things like being well run and in good government, having a certain amount of policy rationality, perhaps an educational system, even there is evidence that equality actually is quite good for economies in many circumstances. All kinds of things that Britain has in recent years been struggling to achieve, frankly. And it may be, I don't think it's, you know, it's, I understand the Brexit vote is not really being about Europe, really. Brexiteers are not interested in Britain, they're not interested in Europe. As far as I can see, they're libertarians. They are interested in the freedom of very rich people. Um, and that is their agenda. This is Rhys Mogg's purse. Um, but fine, and they have successfully harnessed a large part of the population who is just disaffected. And Brexit is a medium. Brexit is their way of expressing their disaffection and saying, look at me, take notice of me. And I don't think it's an entirely irrational um, way of doing that from, from their point of view. And it's worked. And what it means is, in some ways, Brexit is the price that they pay for forcing British politics to take account of their needs and their suffering. Um, if British politics does then change and become, in a way, more solidaristic, I don't exclude this, actually, um, and, and, and becomes more, in a way, inward-looking, and does take account of their needs and their suffering, probably, I think there's a good argument, that Brexit was a price worth paying for. The country, as you said, before Britain entered the, 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 the common market, as it then was, it was, if you like, socialist, egalitarian, and bankrupt. It entered the common market, it thrived like no other country. It loved all this liberal individualism and, and global trade and cosmopolitanism. The British really do that in quite a big way. And it became rich, unequal, and miserable. And maybe it's going to go back to being basically you know, poor, egalitarian, and hopefully not bankrupt quite just yet. So, I mean, I, you know, it's a big if, and every British person I put this to says, but it's not going to happen. It's going to be even worse. It's going to become even more right-wing. So maybe it will. We'll have to see. But in some ways, the real impact of Brexit on the British economy and on manufacturing and on the service industry depends on the way it impacts on British politics, which I think is something that's too early to tell, as Chairman now said about the French Revolution. And anyway, we'll probably join again in 20 years. So. Thank you.